Welcome, welcome to the um, the special purpose <laughs> to the to the special purpose operating systems working group um, presentation and panel. Um, so we are working group in the CNCF, and um, we have representatives of most of the special purpose operating systems, um, ranging from like very specific to more flexible and more generic. We'll give you an overview right now. Um, I'll moderate this session. I will not represent any operating system in this session. And what I'll be doing is um, I'll basically go to you for your questions and your input, uh, give you the mic, and then you can interact with the panel, which is like the whole motivation of this um, of this event. Um, so let's continue. Why don't you folks introduce yourselves? Ah. Okay, uh, so my name is Eric Nordmark. I work for a company Salida in based in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and the other hat I have is that I work in the in in the Linux Foundation as part of LF Edge. We have something called Project Eve. So this is actually an an, an opinionated operating system tar targeting edge computing. So we'll talk a bit more about that. But that's me. I actually have this one now. Ah. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Felipe. I'm CEO at Unicraft um, and part of the uh, creators of the Unicraft Linux Foundation open source project. Uh, we're basically building what's called unikernels. Unikernels are extremely specialized virtual machines that have orders of magnitude faster booting and memory consumption uh, while still retaining a POSIX API so you can run unmodified Linux elves. And I guess we'll be talking more about it throughout. Daniela, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, as um, when I find the unmute. So, hi, my name is Daniel Tal. I'm a PM for Flatcar, working at Microsoft. I'm uh, joining you remotely, as you could see. So, apologies for not making it to Vienna. Um, I'm also co chairing the CNCF uh, TAG runtime and the uh, Special Purpose OS Working Group. And I'm representing uh, Flatcar today. It's um, also a um, special purpose uh, OS, um, immutable, uh, quite flexible in the use case, running um, bare metal, a different cloud provider. Uh, it provides also abstractions like uh, cl um, compatible with uh, cluster API and um, allow to uh, to to have uh, other runtimes besides container runtimes um, and extend the user the, the um, usability of flatcar using a system extension with, with uh, system dc sex um yeah who's uh, next i cannot see the panel this one? okay all right Hey everyone, I'm Sean McGinnis. I work for Lambda. I'm a former maintainer of the Bow Rocket uh, project and um, co-chair of the Special Purpose Operating System Working Group. Um, kind of similar to the other ones, Bow Rocket is a uh, scaled down, uh, specialized operating system distro uh, that is really just, um, you can think of it as really just the kernel with just the components you need to be able to run a container runtime and uh, Kubelet to join a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, has an immutable root file system, no package management, no shell, uh, really, really just focused on being able to run containers in a slimmed down, more secure type of operating system. Hello, I'm Frédéric Croza. I've been in the Linux distribution for almost 24 years now, so still building distribution. I'm currently working at SUSE. Uh, I'm an architect for next generation Linux OS. And what we do these days, we do, we love uh, this kind of small uh, focused OS. So we don't just do one. We have a SLI micro for enterprise, for data center and edge, uh, which is a bit similar in spirit to what our, our friends at Flatcar are doing. And we also, on the OpenSUSE side, we have OpenSUSE Leap Micro, OpenSUSE Micro OS, and we even uh, are going into strange territories like desktop uh, with Aeon, which is a, a very minimalist 
very minimalistic, sorry, uh, desktop, uh, GNOME-based desktop uh, immutable OS. Awesome. Thank you, Fox. I'll briefly switch back to the slide deck. All right, so that was the intro. Um, we're, we're claiming that um, all of us basically represent operating systems that do one thing and one thing very well. Uh, but there are like um, scales uh, and variety. Um, but first of all, maybe you folks haven't um, really heard of uh, special purpose operating systems and most of us take it a little differently. Everybody has their kind of pitch in it. Um, so I think you covered this part last time. Do you wanna? <laughs> the, sorry, the, what is it? What is a special purpose operating? Oh, like? Yes. Um, yeah, especially in the context of of where we're coming from, we're part of the CNCF TAG runtime in the TAG runtime's sub working group for special purpose operating systems. So, kind of that that's kind of the context where we're 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 coming in from where. It's, uh, we're focusing on OS options for running cloud native or running basically containerized usually or specialized workloads uh, where you know, spin up, spin down, uh, easily to, easy to throw away. Um, so there, there's a lot of different types of, types of specialized OSs. There's, there's firmware, there's things like that. Uh, but for the most part, um, when we're talking about special purpose operating systems, um, typically Linux and typically um, container focused. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. I think that, that gives kind of an overview. So this is extremely opinionated and a lot of things are missing here. So we we're trying to put operating systems on a slide, <laughs> on any slide, I mean, it, like, it, like a reference point, right? And the thing we choose is from highly specialized on the, on the left-hand side, starting with the unikernel operating systems to very flexible and customizable on the right-hand side, but not quite as specialized and probably a little larger as well. Um, so maybe we start with Unicraft. Yeah, so I, I see myself almost falling off that edge. So I'm the extremist of the group. Um, so a unikernel is a specialized virtual machine, right? And how do you get it specialized? Well, one of the things that you typically do is you build a modular operating system. So everything on the operating system, memory allocators, network stacks, whatever it is, is actually a module. And then that allows you to pick and choose and customize the actual kernel for each application, including the distro. So that's why we're on the far end of the spectrum. Um, in our case, we try to do that while retaining a POSIX API so we don't break uh, the... So we're not Linux, sorry, but um, at least we agree with Linux you shouldn't break the application, so we keep the POSIX API. So what's a typical application? Where would I use a Unix, uh, Unicorn? Yeah, so um, basically one of the things that we do commercially is we built a cloud platform based on that and that allows us to have millisecond semantics. So you can do scale to zero and cold starts and auto scale all in milliseconds, all of the while running full-fledged complicated heavy apps and applications, right? So it's not so much that uh, people care that we're running a unikernel, they care about the emerging properties of the fact that we're running a unikernel. Awesome. Uh, use case driven. That's the best kind of driven. All right. I guess Edge, uh, I guess um, Eve is next. Yeah. So, so Eve sort of, it didn't grow out of the containers when we started this stuff six years ago. We were looking at how can you actually do things out at the edge? And if you guys are not familiar with edge computing, there's sort of many definitions of this stuff. But the thing that we focused on was the computing that's really so distributed that there's no IT staff whatsoever. There might not be any staff at all. Think of a computer sitting out in a machine in a factory where there's some technicians around or sitting out on a you know a utility scale solar farm where the nearest city is two hour drive away, right? Um, so how do you manage that computer? Um, and what does it mean to manage that from being able to patch it, being able to do updates, being able to reconfigure it? Um, well, it all had to be done over an API and sort of it might 
in, connectivity might be intermittent, and so sort of eventual consistency principles, et cetera, in terms of driving out configuration up and updates. This was sort of the problem we started with. When we started, the focus was on, or actually the, the initial focus was unikernels is clearly the right thing because we're gonna download all of these things to these places. You're not gonna download hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of you know, VMs or containers, right? Um, so unikernels is the right fit, but, but there wasn't much of a community around that at the time. Um, so so in, commercially it turned out that no, everybody's running Windows, right? Uh, so people have an application in Windows and they want to say, how can I make this stuff be easier to update? So I basically said, okay, we're going to run, you know, Windows VMs on a hypervisor, send KVM, whatever. And now we can actually do that as sort of immutably drive out things. You want a new update of this stuff, download the whole thing again, spin it up. And then, you know, we started doing containers as well, sort of running containers in the micro VM as well as being able to run your know, full Kubernetes um, runtime, um, K3S typically, and now you can actually run more workloads at this. But it is still very much focused on what do you need to do so that, you know, it's still built using Linux components, um, but you don't administer it the way you do using Linux, it's immutable. We have your image A, image B as you do updates. You don't go in and ed edit at seriesolve.conf. If you want to change your DNS settings, you actually do that through an API, right? So I think there's a question back there. Coming. I guess if everybody who's using hypervisors can speak maybe generally or specifically, how do you, how do you handle oversubscription of uh, resources, any things in play here, CPU, RAM, all that kind of stuff. And then how do you handle multi-core interference as well? So, so we basically provision things through the, the checks around the API is not allowing any oversubscription. And this is based on sort of having use cases that are coming from an industrial space where they say, okay, if this thing actually started, right, and it got its resources, it shouldn't get any late surprises just because you go deploy something else and suddenly the first thing stops working, right? People don't want that, which is actually making some of this stuff be more challenging because you might not have that much memory, right? And, and typically in the cloud, um, there's more padding going on, figuring out how much memory does Quimo need when you're running KVM Quimo? Well, that seems to be a, an art form that, you know, we, we, we're doing more instrumentation to learn as we go along, basically, because you don't actually know it, depending upon the hardware, depending upon what the applications are doing, that memory usage varies a lot. So how much are you gonna to commit for, to it? That's an example. Yeah, you talked about uh, cache or real time. Yeah, so, so to date, the, the sort of real time-ish use cases are not very strict, what we've seen. I think that there's interest in doing more of this, but 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 sort of the real-time world mostly is used to running on real-time operating systems and on on the bare metal. I was actually talking to people doing software and automotive and what they're what they're doing, right? Sort of. I think there there, so there are ways of doing this stuff if you use the Sun hypervisor. Today, everybody seems to be using the KVM hypervisor to get better hardware support, particularly around GPUs, right? So there's a tension here. Um, the Sun community is actually quite active in the in the, the automotive space to do this stuff and do sort of safety critical applications in some cases. So, so I think that, you know, yes, the good thing is Project E is hypervisor agnostic, right? You can, you can run different ones. So, and we'll see where this stuff go, goes going forward in terms of different use cases. That's a great question. Uh, that brings us to Bottle Rocket. So I'll just reiterate because uh, I, I'm a former maintainer of Bottle Rocket, so it's been about a year since I've worked on it. So my main representation here is as uh, the co-chair of the working group, but um, you know, I have the background. Bottle Rocket is is a fairly popular one, so um, I get to be the representative for it. Uh, so that out of the way, um, Bottle Rocket does move a little more to the right, um, it, but it's it's still a very limited, uh, restricted. Well, I shouldn't say restricted. More of a lockdown uh, distro where um, like I mentioned, it's it's the kernel, um, and then the system services and uh, container D kubelet that you need to run this as a host within, say, a Kubernetes cluster. Um, the there's no package manager, no shell. 
Um, so one of the questions that I used to hear a lot is, um, how do I, uh, how do I use this in this other environment, um, or or can this be used in this other environment? Uh, things like running a hypervisor, uh, with the official community supported versions of this, you can't. Um, the project has been doing a lot of work of putting together uh, an easier way uh, that anyone in the community could could take what's upstream and modify things. So potentially, you could do something like install um, the Zen binaries or, or the KVM binaries and build your own version of Bow Rocket that has exactly what you need. Uh, but as far as the community is concerned, uh, it is really focused on running in the public cloud, primarily AWS, um, running containers, and typically running in a Kubernetes cluster, um, also ECS. So really that's it. Um, you know, things, things like uh, another common one is uh, my security team requires that I install an agent on all of my machines. Well, with an immutable OS or a read-only root file system, you can't install that. So your two options are you either do like I said and, and build your own version, which you're taking on some of the maintenance burden yourself, uh, or really what the focus of the OS is, is running containers. So um, if you need to run something like that, you can run a privileged container that um, runs whatever binaries you need. And, and that's the other part about um, accessing this, like with no shell, how do I administer this? Uh, it, everything is really API driven and meant to be API driven, but occasionally you do need to get into a machine and figure out what's going on. Uh, so it, through the API, you can enable uh, an admin container. And what that admin container is, is really just a privileged container that runs on the machine uh, that mounts what it needs to mount to make it look like when you connect that you're actually on the box. Um, so it's, it's specialized, it's, it's limited in what it includes, but there's ways to extend it. So that's why it's, it gets a little more to the right side of this where there are some extensibility options, um, but it does take a little bit of changing your mindset or, or what you're used to when you administer a Linux box. Awesome. Yeah, let's do uh, uh, OpenSUSE Micros and the other SUSE systems. And I switch back to uh, Danielle for Flatcar. Yeah. Yeah. So um, here, I, th I think I, I, we are a bit different from uh, oh, my, my previous panelist um, because simply we thought the, this kind of OS as how can we make sure that they can still be used without changing too much your own habits, that it's not too much painful to use them and you don't have to relearn everything you, you, you are used to. So, for instance, um, yes, uh, our, our OSs like yeah, OpenSUSE Micro OS, Slim Micro, they are immutable. But not the entire OS is immutable. We, we leverage uh, ButterFS um, to make sure that part of the system, the core part of the system are read-only and snapshot. So we can always go back in time and they cannot be touched while the system is running. But they are part of the system which are read-write. So for instance, um, uh, if you needed to install an agent, an antivirus agent, uh, Road strike? No, uh, let's forget about road strike. Um, but this kind of thing, you could do that, uh, and you would not have to re-image the OS. You could do that without even rebooting the system. Um, in the same spirit, um, uh, a lot of um, specialized OS want to have everything read-only. In our case, uh, etc is not read-only. It's um, uh, we we make some connection with the snapshots so that they can still be, we can st still go back in time if something goes wrong. We are able to roll back also the configuration of the system, but still root is still able to edit the, the ETC and do changes. So in a sense, um, we, we are doing a specialized OS, but which can be used for much, much easier and you don't have to 
learn a lot of things. We still we are still specialized in the sense that what we support, what we advocate is those OSCs are for running containers, either with um, regular container runtime, Docker, Podman, uh, you name it, you, you name them, running Kubernetes, K3S, RK2, yeah, I'm not going to list all of them, and running also VMs, because still uh, in there are cases where you cannot put everything in containers and people want to still run VMs, so again, you can run VMs, and there are cases where you want to run some strange stuff like desktop. Um, so I, myself, I, I did a project to put the entire GNOME stack in desktop. It can be done, it can run, uh, it has a lot of challenges, so in the end we went to something different, like we put just the core, the core desktop on the OS and the rest has to come from other means, like FlatHub, for instance. So there are ways, um, but it's really where you put the cursor, just like the, the slide deck you, you were showing, where you put the, the cursor in terms of flexibility um, and or very much uh, tightening the screws and you, not, you cannot do much, you, not, you need to reimage everything. And now back to, back to Daniel. Daniel, Flatcar? So um, Flatcar is an um, extreme side, I can't remember if it's right or left where you see it, um, of the map, uh, because it allows more flexibility. So if we talk about uh, mutability, that's uh, got the atomic update and the USR petition is read only. Um, because uh, it uh, derived from the history of Flatcar comes from uh, Chromium uh, and uh, also from Core OS. So um, that's uh, where the AB partitioning coming from. And um, if uh, oh, no. you are you 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 muted. I don't know if it's your side or our side. Is it our side? No, demo effect. Oh, it's one second. It's probably not you, Daniel. We're very fixing it. That's the, that's the one. That should be the yeah. one. No. Is this a specialized operating system you're using? Or is <laughs> that, is, that is Fedora. Your microphone appears to be noisy. One second. Ah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Output devices are all gone. I think it's Windows. What happened? Yeah. You are there. Okay. Ah. Yeah, you're back. You're back. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Can you hear me now? Yes. I cannot hear you though, I lost the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I lost the audio completely. Just a second, because uh, oh. I cannot hear anything yet. Okay, okay, we can hear you now. Like we... Can someone say something? Hello. I completely lost the audio, I don't know what's happening. It is... Well, I'm going blind now, so... Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. still there. It's... No, it's... Uh, good. So I was starting to say that uh, we are more on the um, less opinionated side. I can't remember if you see it on the, to the right or left um, because um, mm, yeah. <laughs> that's really annoying. I, I cannot hear you anymore. Um, yeah, so we are less opinionated uh, than the other uh, operating system because we try to stay away uh, from the user experience, right? So um, we all have uh, immutability uh, uh, through AB partitioning, uh, the U USR is uh, read-only. It uh, comes from uh, using uh, 
uh, background of uh, Chromium uh, OS and Core OS. So that's uh, where it, uh, this uh, kind of uh, background come from. Um, the, it's a declarative operating system. So you once define what you want to achieve and uh, kind of let it go, like the update policy, uh, which kind of extensibility would have. Uh, so it doesn't have a doesn't have to be a containerized uh, uh, workload. It could be like also like workload like Wasm. Or uh, that you, that you could achieve uh, through extension of the operating system through uh, system DCSX, which is also declarative in the, the ignition file. Um, yeah, and I lost a bit my train of thoughts now because I'm uh, cannot hear you anymore. So excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. So you, you still um, can't hear us, right? So another oh. thing I think I mentioned also like uh, that uh, you could use. Um, you could use for for orchestration. Uh, you don't have uh, to to use Kubernetes, uh, but like if you want like another uh, abstract uh, on Kubernetes, uh, we are also um, um, actively uh, uh, working on uh, Kepi. So that's another uh, layer there. Um, and uh, besides that. Yeah, I would think I would uh, rejoin the the call, so I would be able to hear you too. Yeah, let's let's try that. Let me. She can still see us. So, yeah. All right. Um, at this point, we're gonna take questions. So, if any folks of you, <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, you're back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, hallelujah! That was uh, very annoying. Awesome. Okay. So we're every, everyone's back. So any questions specific to any of the um, operating systems we're talking about or anything more generic from you folks? Maybe one question. How many people I, uh, have already used one of those systems or is it completely new to you? One, two. Okay. That's good. That's interesting. Oh, wow. That's... Um... That's really, that really is interesting. So I think we're going to move um, Susa Micro as more on the, even more on the right, because I, I'm not sure, but none of you folks run a desktop, right? Like, wow. That's, I, I heard about some crazy folks um, trying to do that with some immutable operating systems in a Bluefin project, but yeah, it's very prototypey. Um, so Bluefin is actually a really cool um, project. It's, I'm, I apologize, I, I recently learned about it from a colleague in, in uh, CNCF, George. Um, he's one of the um, core maintainers or contributors to the project. Right now they're largely focused um, on bringing students in and getting them more exposed to special purpose operating systems. Um, right now I believe they're running through some test cases with Steam Decks and that seems to be where they're getting most of like their user interaction and exposure of kind of this immutable operating system and exposing this whole new world of possibility to students in academia. Awesome, thank you. Maybe in one of the next sessions we'll have folks on the, on the stage. Never mind. Uh, so, so one comment on the UI side. I mean, one thing that, that we've seen is that, yes, people just want to, you know, drop ship these things, plug them into the network and power, and they're up and running, right? They get onboarded. But there's cases when that's not that easy. Like, you're in some industrial environment, there's some HTTPS proxies that need certificates configured, etc. You need to have some way of actually configuring it. And it's not a, an actual desktop, but you need some form of local UI in some cases. And, and how do you actually do that in the same way, right? And now you get into all of the complexity of, oh, is there actually a screen there and a keyboard? Or, you know, do you run something, over, do you run a, a, a configuration service initially for bootstrapping over HTTP, you know, an HTTP server or whatever, right? So in, 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 in the real world, right, when you talk about deploying things at these various places, you might need different things that require users to be able to do things to the box. That kind of leads me to something um, 
that have, having moved more from that uh, developer side to a user of these types of operating systems, um, one of the things for, for many of them are the deployment is different. Um, you don't insert an ISO and run through an installer. Uh, a lot of the times it's, it's API driven or you, you, you provide a config file. Um, some have cloud in it, I believe, some don't. Some have ignition. Um, things like file rocket, uh, you either use the API or you provide a, a TOML file uh, to, to boot up. So there are differences that you do need to be aware of if you are considering using a specialized OS. Um, and talking to teams uh, since leaving Battle Rocket, it's, it's more of a challenge really than I think I appreciated as a Battle Rocket developer is that um, conceptually it's fairly easy. You just, okay, instead of entering these commands, you, you put that configuration in a file and you submit that somehow. Um, but there, a lot of teams have pretty well baked workflows for how they do deployments and, and Terraform and, and those types of things. So uh, one of the biggest challenges I've run into working with other teams that want to use a specialized OS is um, deploying an OS isn't, isn't their goal, isn't what they want to be doing. They have an application or, or a solution that they're trying to deploy. And getting an OS out there is one piece of that. Um, and, and, you know, various pressures, priorities. Uh, I've seen, unfortunately, there's some teams, well, even though it, it might not take a long time to ad adapt to a new way of doing things, that's just one more thing that's that's on their checklist. So, um, you know, oh, for now, we're just going to go with uh, general purpose OS, and we'll get back to that later and, and try to migrate. Um, so, you know, not to discourage you to use a special purpose OS, because there are a lot of benefits for it, but just so that you are aware as you're going into it, since a lot of uh, folks said that you haven't used one of these, uh, if you plan to, um, just be aware that you, you, there probably will be some um, adapting to different ways of doing things that you may be used to with a uh, general purpose operating system. I just want to add to that point since I'm on the far end of that scary spectrum. Um, sort of the way we try to um, get that specialization and try to make that world not too scary. So in our case, uh, we, were, we're, we were targeting cloud deployments. And the way we settle on that is uh, Docker files, basically. So our, our system, you'll, there's an open source CLI tool called Craft, and you'll just point it at a standard Docker file, and then it'll just automatically convert things into this very specialized uh, unikernel and then deploy it. So the idea being that if you have CICD systems and you know Docker files, um, then all you need to do is modify your Docker file, specify what you want, want to build and run, and then it'll just automatically uh, go, right? Um, so trying to find uh, sort of that nice space between you get the benefits of the specialization and hopefully you're not too scared about the tooling. And just to add, and I fully in agreement with everybody here, I think the, the return of investment of learning those new things are really like, you will really get why it's interesting to invest there because the reward are so much higher. Yeah, so to, to that point, um, things using unikernels called boot in five milliseconds instead of seconds or minutes. So we're talking orders of magnitude, or maybe they, an, an Nginx web server consumes uh, eight megs to run as opposed to 100 megs or whatever it might be. So it's, it's orders of magnitude. Daniela, I think you had your hand up. Daniela, did you have something? Daniela, do you want to add something? To reiterate, like, uh, about... Um... If you're going and, and thinking, you know, going shopping and thinking uh, what you want to choose, like uh, there is like the variety goes from, um, you know, uh, operating system that don't have really a kernel to, to um, almost as far as uh, as um, special operating system go to almost general purpose in the usability that it gives you at least. 
and uh, they're like you need to think if you want to have the like API based um, centralized way for upgrading or would you prefer the, the nodes to be more um, independent and uh, have like a B partitioning or or having no kernel at all or having uh, um, strict immutability in the case that you could kind of choose the flavor of your operating system so it, it also influenced the size of uh, the boot uh, partition that you would have and so on so it really depends on your use case your uh, infrastructure uh, the architecture that you want to support but i think after you uh, kind of predicate on this requirement uh, the um, the operation uh, becomes much easier. So I think it well, uh, um, it, it's uh, definitely worth to, to invest in that. Do you have a question? Uh, can you speak to what the working group is thinking about? Because we've got a very interesting collection of folks with different ideas but what are you coming together to do other than presumably just share what you're doing and have coffee? Yeah, good, good question. Um, really the idea behind getting the group together was there were different groups of us working on similar things, but uh, there wasn't a lot of cross project discussion happening. And at the same time, we all had the same issue uh, with some of these things we're talking about where there wasn't this awareness of special purpose operating systems and how they might be different and why you might want to use one. Um, so some of it is a little trying to get some cross-pollination, you know, open source, we're all better working together. Um, not like we're trying to, to come up with one OS, but there's great ideas that we can share um, that's just gonna benefit all of us. Um, and then uh, just, Doing things like this, getting the word out there. Uh, if if you uh, want to learn more about these operating systems, a great thing to point out is there is a YouTube channel for Tag Runtime. And within that YouTube channel, there's a playlist for special purpose operating systems. And the first um, six, eight months of the, the working group, each meeting we had a different OS do a presentation of going over what their OS is, you know, how it might be the same as others, how it's different. Um, so if you're curious about Flatcar or Unicrap, um, there's recordings out there and you, and you can go play those back and learn more about that um, in addition to websites and everything else that have, have all the documentation. Um, the next phase, so, we, so we've kind of gone through most, we're, we're still uh, trying to get the word out and get other distros um, participating. But the next phase that we're, we're trying to get to is um, trying to see, are, are there white papers that we can publish uh, that, that take some of these concepts and, and can kind of frame it in a good way for someone brand new to the concept can uh, read the white paper and kind of get that, that basic understanding of, and being able to make some of those decisions of, is this right for me? Is this right for my business? Uh, if it is, where on that spectrum might I focus my attention, those types of things. Uh, so going forward, it's, it's really uh, continuing that education and looking for ways, interacting with the community, uh, seeing where we can focus some attention and try to, try to improve the whole ecosystem. Can I uh, actually uh, have, ask a question to the audience? Um, since uh, not a lot of you are, are experienced with uh, uh, container uh, optimized Linux, I um, I would like to know what uh, what like kind of um, preliminary thoughts do do you have when you approach it? If you like want to consider one of them, what what are the main things that are going through your head when when, when you're like considering them. I think the big one is um, there's a misconception out there that containerization is a security tool. 
Um, it's not. It's actually just the opposite. In fact, um, there's a lot of good reasons why containerizing reduces your security uh, because you can hide stuff that doesn't get update in a platform uh, update in a platform update. So really, it shouldn't be thought of that way, and we should be talking about it that way. It's not a security tool. It's a partitioning tool. Virtualization is a better way to do that, but that's why I asked you the question about oversubscription and multi-core interference. So if anybody else has anything to say about oversubscription, because of course the trade-off when you virtualize is you have to own a certain memory footprint. I know VirtualBox has some preliminary or they worked on some oversubscription. I, I've not looked into it, but it seems like there's, there's ways. So that's the trade-off. If you want to be able to oversubscribe your usage, containerization is a great way to do it, but it's not a security tool. Right, but if you want to get security, maybe virtualization is the way to go. But then you're losing out on your margins are never good enough for. So I don't know. I just drop that bomb and let anybody want to. Uh, I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll take this one. Um, so Danielle and um, Sean share the group, and I'm the tech lead. Um, and I, I'd say you're fifty percent right. Like con containerization is. Um, isolation of applications that prevent um, apps to shoot other apps in the, sh in the food by accident is not, is not as much a security tool. But virtualization isn't either. Um, if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, level one terminal fault, it is actually a lot better exploitable in a virtualized environment if you're a guest virtual machine than in a host OS. So this is the way you need to think about that. Um, if you isolate for security, I think nothing beats individual um, uh, separated um, like hardware, yeah. right? Okay. And picking up that bomb, uh, assuming you have to share a server because that's totally out of your control when you go to the public cloud, then... Um, the virtual machine is the golden standard. You have a hypervisor underneath. Whether you know it or not, whatever you're deploying, you have a virtual machine underneath you. Given that, uh, I have a horse in this race, obviously. Um, Unikernels is the way to go because they're the leanest possible virtual machine that you could possibly run. So if you're forced to use a virtual machine, which you are, maybe this is the right way to run it so that hopefully most of the CPU and RAM resources go to your app. I'd say one other thing, uh, because of the security concerns, that may be a reason to use a special purpose operating system uh, because a lot of us have immutable OSs, you know, read-only root file system. If someone breaks out of a container, there's only so much damage they can do um, versus, you know, it, there's just some more protections in place. It doesn't eliminate everything, but it can eliminate some issues. Yeah, that, that was what I was going to was going to say as well, yes, if, given that people are going to run containers or VMs or whatever, yeah, you need to figure out how are they going to keep those things updated, right? And how are you going to scan them, et cetera. And, you know, in some cases, these, these operating systems help with that because you now can actually use existing mechanisms to drive updates, be it, be it, be it Kubernetes, be it using the Eve API, whatever, right? So, but you still want to have a substrate that where you, you don't want that to be easily subverted, right? So how can you ensure the integrity of that substrate by having it be immutable, et cetera? Right? So, and I think that that something that, that again, the, the tools that people have built, like, like Secure Boot and things like this, well, in many cases, they're focusing on things where there's some a human being there, right? So if you're running it on your laptop or, or on your phone, well, if something goes wrong, you will get something on your screen. And the, the space we went after is like, no, there is no human being within you know, a two-hour drive. So, so that, that's not a very useful thing. So how can we actually do this where we can leverage the tools that exist, the, the sort of standards, but still say, hey, this thing can actually boot even if it's sort of deemed something was modified, maybe someone updated the BIOS, right? Uh, but phone home and, and tell somebody about it, but, but keep your applications protected. Because I think in all of these cases, what people care about is not the OS. I'm sorry, may, maybe there's too many OS people here, but, but I've worked in OSs for most of my career. But what matters to them is the application they're gonna run, right? And those applications might come in the form of a container or some legacy you know, Windows monolithic thing, but, but that's what they care about. And how can we make their life easier, right? Uh, including around security. And if I summarize a bit what, what was said, and to try to uh, not containerize, but compartmentalize your bomb, uh, I think it's, it's really a matter of adding, and in security, it's always like that. We add 
layer after layer of after layers, like we talked about immutable uh, file system, we talked about maybe security, uh, SLA Linux, Aparmore, you name it. Uh, and, and also that's, uh, I mean, it was already touched. Whatever you want to run, it needs to be, um, if it's container, the base container which are used, it, it should still be coming from a trusted sources, updated from time to time, if not kind of automatically, making sure that the OS is able to automatically update containers when there are new containers available. This is, again, a lot of uh, Lego bricks we put together in all our OSs to make sure that the workload, which will be containers or VMs, will be able to run as safe as possible. But of course, it's not a, a magic bullet. That's, I think that's a nice uh, finishing uh, wrapping up sentence. Uh, we should be session chair. Are we, are we through? We have yeah, he's right there. Do, do we have links to our uh, working group on the... Oh, right. The yeah, and on the yeah, slides, on the slides. I cannot see, so like you, you need to do it. Oh, you, you just see the audience. That's true. Um, yes. the, the other thing that if people are more... In, so LF Edge is having a half day on Thursday here. <laughs> if you want to find out more about Project Eve, and there is some discussion there as well as other LF Edge projects. So uh, plug for that as well. So yeah, that's the that's the working group. Um, that's our entry page. You'll find everything there. Uh, we have meetings once a month, and um, in the meeting agenda that's hidden behind some of those QR codes, you'll also f uh, find links to the video recordings, basically presentations of all of the special purpose operating systems that uh, came over. And we had a lot um, of those folks dropping by and presenting uh, theirs, but uh, there are more out there. <coughs> so, uh, um, Ubuntu Core is missing, right? So Ubuntu Core would be nice if you're listening to us. Yes, um, Ubuntu Core is here. <laughs> yes, perfect. All right, then. So you folks, you folks, drop by um, and say hello if um, you uh, are interested in like the whole space. As uh, Sean said, we only we are only bootstrapping this. We're only getting started. Um, yeah, just drop by and um, give us a give us a shout out. Yeah, you could look at it as um, office hours, just drop by. You don't uh, need to come with a specific uh, working item. All right, folks. Thanks for joining us. Um,